see me talking. Okay, cool. All right, no problem. Hello. Hey, everybody. Welcome to 8 o'clock Golems and Pop Culture. I'm KT Katzman, and, and this is something that I have probably been getting ready for since I was about eight, hijacking every nonfiction monster book in the local public library. You can, if you're wondering, you can find me over here on my Twitter page, at IWriteMonsters, and you may be wondering what my qualifications are to talk about golems for an audience like this. Um, I'm going to just mention something about the role-playing game Deadlands, which is basically cowboys and zombies. So I'm about to run a role-playing game for my friends. I'm going to tell them a story, and we're going to say we're going to do supernatural stuff on Earth. And then I come home, and there's a betting pool on my wall with names, dates, and they say, like, KT, you are not allowed to look at this. And I'm like, okay, what is up with the betting pool? And it turns out that six of my closest friends were betting actual money. If you give KT Earth and the Supernatural, how many games are we going to go until we meet the Golem of Prague? That is the kind of person we're talking about today. So I'm going to give my love of this material, hopefully through the internet, to shine on in you. But before we do, I have to define a few terms. First of all, what is a myth? I'm going to go off the crash course mythology definition of a myth when we talk about the myth of a golem, because I'm not going to use the term myth as a false story. For myth, I'm going to tell you what I tell my literature classes. When I talk about the myth of a golem, I am talking about a story which is significant to a culture and often has some kind of exploratory value and significant staying power. So I am not going to comment on the truth or falsehood of this story because you got to realize something. This is part of an active religion. I mean, this is Judaism. And so this story is still held to and believed to by people, by rabbis, by significant parts of the Jewish population today in the more orthodox stories. People who are descended from the characters of this story still comment about, yes, this happened. My great, 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 great grandfather was there and did this. It still is of significance to living people. When the Israeli computer divisions and it basically had the first big Israeli computer, they called an Orthodox rabbi and he explained the story of the golem at the press conference, and they called it the golem, and he said, I hope this time it doesn't go nuts. So we're going to have to talk about exactly what this story is. The third thing I have to introduce is nowhere near as pleasant. This is the nasty part of history that you cannot understand the golem without. This is called the blood libel. Now, the Jewish people over our years have been, been given to any number of falsehoods and rumors about us. Uh, the, my absolute, I want to say favorite in air quote, is the fact that every single teacher I had at my Judaica high school and my mother-in-law while traveling up and down the East Coast were all asked in the gas station once someone learned they were Jewish, hey, can we see your horns? But that's a story for another time. The blood libel was a much nastier thing. The idea is Jews bake matzah every Passover, an unleavened bread, which, if you have to eat matzah for a week, can be something of an atrocity in itself. And a story was spread that Jews killed Christian children to put the blood in the matzah. I've had just about every flavor of matzah, and there's nothing you can put in there to make it tastier. Maybe poppy soup. But this was, to a certain type of person, a useful falsehood because what you would do is since the jewish people were the money lenders 
you weren't allowed to charge interest if you were Christian. And why would you go into loans without charging interest? If you wanted to get rid of a loan you owed to a Jew, say you were going to have all your interest build up, you know, it's five, six hundred years ago. It's before in the germ theory of disease. You find a dead kid. You leave it on the Jewish person's lawn. And then in the morning, people will be like, oh, look, the Jews have taken the blood out of this kid. And that usually leads to torches and pitchforks of not the specific Jewish person in question or their family, but the entire neighborhood. So this was a weaponized falsehood. And this led to the stories of my people of a way to create a protector. Now, one of the earliest golems I found was the, we could say, was Adam. The word golem has different meanings in Hebrew. It can mean cocoon, it can mean embryo, it can mean shapeless mass. And Adam has been referred to in Jewish tradition sometimes as a golem, because after all, he is crafted from dust. Now, in the terms of humans creating a golem, before we get to our usual material of what they're made out of, we found the rabbi Ibn Gabirol, who, let me say, is really hard to find information for online because he sh they used his name for a friggin' anime character. That happens with a lot of historical research now. Who apparently created out of wood a golem woman maid? I have no idea why that's not an anime now. In any case... He made this servant, he showed it off, he used mystic powers given by his knowledge of God, not like any kind of warlock or any deal with a devil or demon, which, believe me, are in Jewish mythology. And when the king heard, he's like, oh, no, don't worry, I'll, uh, I'll just make her wood again, which has horrifying implications. Um, a goal, the first golem of the material that we really are familiar with is the golem of Rabbi Elijah. This I took from a screen cap from a pretty entertaining YouTube video. And here we see the common conception of a golem. It's made out of, well, originally clay, but it's come to be any kind of earthy thing. Stone, mud, we'll get to that. It's made by a holy person. And you can see it's got Hebrew on the top. The golem is brought to life by words. Words are very important in Jewish folklore. You know, the Lord spoke, let there be light, and there was. If you read the seminal collection of mythology, Legends of the Jews, and when I say seminal, I mean it takes 42 pages to get to the creation of Earth. There's literally a point in it in which the different Hebrew letters have an argument in front of God over who gets to start the first word spoken. Words are important to Judaism. And so normally the word we're going to see up there is the word emeth, which means truth. So Elijah of Chelm creates this golem as a protector, one of our first protector golem stories. And the idea in this one is that the golem has a really honking big axe, he stands in the marketplace, and if anyone is going to beat up a person of the Jewish persuasion, the golem will go choppy, choppy on him. This is the first golem that we would recognize the way the story is today. But we don't normally talk about Rabbi Elijah's golem. Like, in terms of golems, this is the Friday the 13th Part 1, where Rabbi Elijah is not the Pamela Voorhees killer of the first movie, where everyone is like, wait, I thought it was Jason Voorhees. And I'm like, no, Jason comes in in part two. The Jason Voorhees in this case, the golem that everybody talks about, is the golem of Rabbi Lowell in Prague. The golem of Prague is a story that is supposed to have happened in the 16th century. And the rabbi, who is also known as the Maharal, which is a Hebrew acronym that basically means the most holy teacher, Lowell, heard that big things were moving against the Jews. A blood libel was going to be planned or an organized extermination of Jews, which is called a pogrom. And he 
takes clay, clay from a riverbed, and he fasts for a long period of time. He walks backwards around it a certain sacred numeral of times. He fasts, and he writes the holy word, and he brings to life this clay figure who becomes the protector of the Jews of Prague. That is, until he has to deactivate it. And at this point, we hit two of the significant things about golems. Firstly, the, the golem is deactivated eventually. The many deaths of the golem take different form. There's usually four different reasons why the golem eventually is out of the way. The most common is, in the stories, although not necessarily in the original stories, but more so nowadays, the golem goes on a rampage eventually. That once he tastes violence, he is overcome by the violence, and he has to be destroyed. Or the golem could just cause mischief. Not necessarily on purpose. Because after all, what I once heard was that computers are the world's most sophisticated idiots. They'll do exactly what you tell them to do, but they'll do exactly what you tell them to do. I had a children's book when I was younger in which the rabbi told the golem, make potato pancakes for Passover. And he made so many potato pancakes, he filled the streets. Often, a golem story can have kind of a happy ending for the golem in that the golem is just deactivated because he's not needed anymore. He does his job. And then very often he's put in a crate and put away for some further time. These all can be combined in that the golem is about to be deactivated, and he knows it, and he rebels because he doesn't want to die. Now, very often, the golem communicating with the rabbi and saying this stuff is really difficult because in most of the original legend, the golem is mute. He can't speak. That's part of the difference between humanity. He does not have a soul. Which remember, the word soul comes from breath the Greek word for or breath, and because of that, he can't speak, he can't talk. The other part of the golem story that I want to talk about. Oh, and uh, this story, by the way, became much more popular when, and known when it was first printed in the Sepurim, which was a German book in the mid-18th uh, century. Now, mid-19th century, which means that, like, even though it wasn't written down, we can see that this story probably influenced other creations, even though it wasn't written down before, say, our most famous golem-like creation. Because this story of the golem is the core, the kernel, of all of the stories about some kind of robot, some kind of creation that gains awareness, that comes into conflicts to its creator, and decides to make hell and fire on those who created it. This is the core of science fiction. The Golem is really one of the first science fiction stories. And you can see it in Frankenstein, and the direct influence will be soon. The other aspect of the Golem story that is really important to the Jewish people is the fact that it shares certain similarities with King Arthur's death and travels to Avalon. In many Arthurian cycles, Arthur is resting in Avalon and one day, when the British people most need him, he will come back. And there is a story told whenever people really, really need to believe this story, that the golem is still there, still in the attic of the old shul in Prague. And if need be, someone can bring it back. There is a tale often told that when the Nazis took Prague, the first thing they did was go to the old shul to make sure that the golem wasn't there. And the story goes that the Nazis who went up never came down. Now, there's this specific synagogue is the Alta Shul. It means the old shul, the old um, synagogue. Um, people have been there up in the attic as recent as 2014, and no one has seen the Golem Crate. You can't go there anymore because I believe they've broken the access, uh, whether the ladder or staircase, so people couldn't go there. But of course, the families of those in the know say, 
Of course, they're not going to say the golems there. After all, people are going to want the golem. And so here we get the legend of a protector who will return one day. If you need it, the golem will come. This story is put into the next most popular form about 70 years after the Sidurim. Now, I'm not going to go back. In The Golem by Gustav Merrick. Now, Merrick was a banker who had the usual flaws of the artistic folk, um, the people who love imagination but are forced to handle money, like many role-playing game store owners I have met. Not Brian. We love you, Brian. But he, as a banker, basically got arrested for embezzlement. He wasn't really embezzling as far as we can tell. He just was really bad with money. And he went into journalism, and then he went into writing, and he wrote The Golem, which was a huge success. 1920, if I recall correctly. But it's not really about The Golem. He, it's basically a vignette and story of the Jewish ghetto, the neighborhood the Jews are forced to stay in. And The Golem is throughout the story. The spirit of The Golem is basically the avatar, the spirit of the Jewish people. So it's not really a straight fantasy golem story but it was really popular so 200,000 copies in 1920 that's pretty big so we actually did get a movie although whether or not the movie was inspired by the book or just popular is an uh, open question however the problem is we got a movie in 1950 and people who love horror will especially will know that those movies very often get lost the Golem of 1915 does not have no, it, it's not known to exist yet. And I say known and not it doesn't exist because there was a European film critic who swore in the 50s, oh no, I saw an unedited copy. There's one film collector who has a copy. He swore me to secrecy and I can't tell you where. But we don't have this movie or the sequel. We just have the third movie which honestly may not be that bad. So in this original Golem movie, they find people find the ancient people's Golem, it falls in love, it runs amok, somewhat standard. The sequel, you know what Ray says in Ghostbusters about how they don't make them like this anymore? In fact, they never made them like this anymore. I can't think of another movie like The Golem and the Dancing Room. So the actor who plays the Golem, who is the director of the movie, who's the writer of the movie, is Paul Vergerner. And Vergerner is a fascinating character. He was forced later to work in the Nazi motion picture industry while funneling money, funneling money to the rebels and also hiding folks from the Nazis. Like, uh, it, it's as if you had Wes Craven playing Freddy or James Well playing Frankenstein. The director is the monster. And this movie is about him in that he hears as a character in his own movie that people are scared of his golem movie. So he dresses as the golem to go scare people and a particular dancing girl at a party. It's like having a movie in which the Nick Castle hears, hey, people like Mike Myers. I'm going to go try to strike up a romance with someone by dressing as Mike Myers. It's a horror movie rom-com. I've never heard of another movie like this. So all we have is the third movie. And sometimes when you have the third movie in the series, that could be a good thing or that could be a very bad thing. But in this case, for me, we get exactly what he wanted because the third movie is called The Golem, Who He Is and How It He Came to Be. And so especially lovely for people like me who want to know about Jewish folklore. This is the prequel movie. This is the story of the golem. Instead of just, oh, hey, there was a golem. We woke up the golem. And now the golem's killing. The classic golem story is right here in the 1921, which, I, look, I, I love this movie. I recommend seeing this movie, not just for historical basis, but I was also greatly entertained by this. So, Der Golem is the story of Rabbi Lowell, who hears that there is going to be a 
decree against the Jews. So, and, you know, this was common in medieval oh, ages and even Renaissance ages. I mean, you know, at the Christopher Columbus's time, it had only been a few years since the Spaniards had said, hey, or I should say the Spanish crown, um, all the Jews have to get out. And then they invented tapas, the little meat sandwiches by uh, the party serving people pork as a way to make sure there weren't any Jews around. This kind of stuff happened. So this specific decree against the Jews says, the many serious charges against the Jews can no longer be disregarded, being that they crucified our Lord, a crime that the Catholic Church only absolved them for in the 1950s. I'm not bitter. Wrongfully ignore the holy Christian holidays. Remember when Easter were. Thirst after the goods and lives of their fellow men. About that one. And practice the black arts. Hence we decree that all Jews evacuate their quarter, known as the ghetto. Like you didn't put them there, king, before the new moon. So, the Jews are accused of the black arts. And... Rabbi Lowell knows that this is going to be a problem because he reads it in the stars by practicing astrology. And the moment that he realizes he has to do something because the Jews are being you know, accused of using the black arts, he creates a flaming circle on the ground. He grabs his pentacle and in the name of the Lord of Spirits, he summons the demon Ashtaroth. You kind of have to wonder exactly how the movie actually views the Jews. Because, you know, in the stories, it's always holy power. It is a direct miracle. The idea that holy Jewish men can create miracles is central to many Orthodox factions. You know, uh, the Chabad Lubavitchers, just off the top of my head. But in this case, they're actually, you know, they're doing the black magic. Although whether or not he's actually, like, forcing good stuff to happen over, out of the demon is really up to anybody's call. So Ashtaroth appears as a floating face, and like I really can't do justice with just still images. It is still a creepy effect, literally a hundred years later. This is a great scene. And Ashtaroth in Palestinian mythology usually is part dragon, but was known for having terrible, terrible breath. You think a demon that was reputed to know all events past, present, and future would be able to figure out Listerine. But it's appropriate that he has that terrible breath, because what does he do? He tells him how to, a life-giving word that can animate a corpse or a creation, and he literally breathes it out. He creates these wispy, flaming letters in the air. It's a really good special effect, especially when you're considering it's 1920. So... Using this word, they create the golem. Now, I want to draw your attention to the star on the golem's chest. It, yes, it's a pentacle. It's not a Jewish star. Remember, we're dealing with 1920s Germany. But that is basically the on and off switch. And one of the big conflicts of the movie is that whole rebelling against your creator thing. because. Whenever the golem needs to be deanimated, like Rabbi Lowell doesn't want to have to deal with him anymore, he literally grabs the star, takes it off the golem, and the golem just kind of head down, falls over. And it's an alternate comedy and horror the first time the golem puts his hand over the star, and he's like, no, I want this. You can have it. And I'm not showing all the scenes from this movie, because it's a really good movie, where Gurner is a great actor. And, like, the scene in which the golem first gets angry, just the way he uses his eyes and his teeth, it's, you know, there's a kind of acting you see in silent movies you don't usually get, but, you know, really great presentation. And, of course, the golem will eventually go berserk and start to go on a rampage, in this case, because, apparently, once the stars are right again, Hints of Cthulhu, then, of course, this precedes Cthulhu by six years. I'm just making a reference. The golem starts to go rabid because of Ashtaroth. Now, one of the things I want to point out is that this is 1920, and there's a scene in which a created, sympathetic monster 
is handed a flower by an innocent and smells it and smiles 11 years before James Whale's Frankenstein. The Golem is an incredibly influential piece of cinema, and it's, it's really good. I really want to recommend, I just got the Kino Classics Blu-ray version. It, I'm astounded at how well the quality is. I mean, you could go to YouTube and watch it at any time because, you know, public domain, but it's a good movie. And Golem's kind of sat in the public consciousness for about the next 50 years or so. Oh, yeah, you, you'd eventually, uh, occasionally see one in a book on monsters. Like, we don't really have a good Golem year until 1974. We get the Golem in Marvel Comics, who lasts maybe eight issues before he's canceled. He has to have his story finished while hanging out with the Thing in Marvel 2 and 1. The Devil Hordes of Kabbalah. Um, Dan, I don't think that means what you think it means. But 74 is a really good year for Golems. We would probably not be talking about Golems if it wasn't for what happened between 1974 and 1977, which is where we get to our archaeo gaming part of this talk. Because the Golems were incorporated into gaming. With the publishing, well, first mentioned in when the game comes out in 74, and then later codified in 77 in the Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Monster Manual. There's the copy I have that I traded for a Howard the Duck meets Spider-Man comic in third grade. They were fighting a supervillain with exploding frisbees and rockets, roller scooters. I totally got the better deal. So, Dungeons & Dragons is incredibly culturally important. I want to try to emphasize to you, before I cover how the golems were treated in D&D and how that changed every way that they ever were portrayed after that, how influential Dungeons & Dragons is. Um, like... I use the author Seabury Quinn as an example. I call it my C the Seabury Quinn law. This is Seabury Quinn. Seabury Quinn is not important. You have probably never heard him. Back in the 1920s, he would have he would be like one of the most popular weird tale horror writers, science fiction writers. But nobody did like in-depth analysis of it. He went to the popular shelves he left. Nobody cares. There's no real Seabury Quinn scholarship. Who do we remember? The people that we put into our pop culture. Not only do we remember H.P. Lovecraft, who, yes, wildly, let me put it this way. He, um, this is his essay on all the horror stories he liked, and he said that uh, Merrick's Golem was one of the most wonderful weird stories he ever read, which is incredible because, of course, Jewish story, Lovecraft was a raging anti-Semite. Um, I think the best description I ever heard of Lovecraft's personality was someone online who said that Lovecraft was terrified of three things. A cold, godless universe, anyone who wasn't a white New Englander Protestant, and fish. But because Lovecraft is influential, the people he talked about are still remembered. This essay, Supernatural Horror and Literature, preserved people's careers for a century. There are folks who are still talked about and read today just because Howard wrote about them back then. And in the same way, Dungeons and Dragons told the nerds of the day from the very, like, almost first read book set, look, here's the inspirational source material of the game. If you like Dungeons and Dragons... Maybe you should read this. And I know I went to my used bookstore several times with this photocopied in hand. So Dungeons and Dragons not only was influenced by fantasy, but it influences fantasy. Because props of fantasy fans grow up being told, this is fantasy, this is the canon. You should read the books Recorded in the sacred appendix N of the Dungeon Master's Guide. Like, li literally, if you mention appendix N, people know what this is in gaming. It's that influential. Although it is only the second most interesting appendix in the Dungeon Master's Guide, 
The other one is the tables where you can roll to see what random sex worker you meet in the city streets. And if you want to get your parents' attention and get them interested in what Dungeons and Dragons is, there are a few ways better to ask your mom, Mom, what's the difference between a brazen sumpret, a saucy tart, and a wanton wench? But I digress. So we have Dungeons and Dragons. And, Dun and Dungeons and Dragons has the effect that Guitar Hero had when I had kids who were literally born after 9-11 fighting over or who gets to have Welcome to the Jungle as their ringtone in the school. It gives a bump in popularity to the golems. So let's look at what Dungeons and Dragons defines a golem as basically for all time. Golems are magically created monsters. So here we got a big change. It's not just God. Of course, you know, this is Dungeons and Dragons. There are many gods. It's not just divine, holy powers. Now, a wizard can create a monster, bring it to life, and it is a golem. This is the change that affects popular media, video gaming, fantasy, everything since then this is probably the most important sentence that you could read on golems within the lifetime of most of my audience so let's talk about the four golems that are are codified in dungeons and dragons which have shaped everything that has come first first we have the classic clay golem and as we see this is Rabbi Lowell's golem, basically. I mean, we don't have Hebrew on it, but it's a powerful, lawful, good cleric of high level can create a magical golem. This, this is it. And next, I really don't think I have to explain where the flesh golem comes from. So once again, Frankenstein and the golem are classed together. The iron golem is pretty obviously tal Talos from Jason and the Argonauts, which makes sense, because Gary Gygax, the creator of Dungeons and Dragons, would often take stuff from pop culture, whether it's a Rakshasha from Cold Jack the Night Stalker, or literally, my kids today have storybooks with monsters that Gary Gygax made up by buying some weird rubber toys. Let me close the door, because those kids are... Weird. All right. And then finally, a stone golem. You know, for any general animated statue, I I regret that I cannot tell whether that particular stone golem is based on any one conception. The other three I can. But here we have, importantly, anyone with magical power can create a golem. Golems can be of multiple old types. And one of the most important things for golems' popularity in the game Golems are mean sons of guns. For example, if we talk about the clay golem, when it hits you and damages you, your character cannot heal until they go to a really nice high-level priest and really beg forgiveness. If it cracks your ribs, that rigs are going to stay cracked. These golems cannot be damaged by a legion of archers. They require magical weapons powerful magical weapons to hit them they're immune to almost all magic out of the dozens and dozens of spells in the dungeons and dragons rule books there's like four that affect them and the rest just bounce off them like water off a stone duck's back and so when a dungeon master a storyteller a referee of dungeons and dragons was like i really need to whip beat on my players oh hey i'll use a golem or, hey, that statue turns out to be a golem. So you had a monster that would get used quite a bit. This is what preserves the golem in pop culture. And Dungeons and Dragons, which influences everyone from Stephen Colbert to Vin Diesel, never gives up on the idea that you can make any type of stuff into a golem. You have golems made out of bone, which are snakes. Scarecrow golems, doll golems, bone golems, gargoyle golems, stained glass golems. And yes, that is probably directly referencing the first CGI creature, the stained glass knight from Young Sherlock Holmes. But what D&D &D has done 
is that it has created a label so that anyone that sees an artificial being in gaming will be like, oh yeah, that's a golem. That makes sense. You get brain golems. I always wanted an action figure then. And finally, for that for Dungeons and Dragons possibly most important demographic back in the day, 13-year-olds like to cast a Stranger Things, you get the naked lady golem. I think that's all I need to say about that. Uh, I was very happy at the age of 12 to have bought this book from the public library for 15 cents. 50 cents. So, in any case, this is the first of two steps where the golems become onto the public consciousness. But in order to see how they really permeate ideas, even aside from Dungeons and Dragons, we have to see another failed golem. And his name is Rob the Robot, and most people threw it against the wall. So, the Nintendo Entertainment System comes out. 1986, if I recall correctly. And it revolutionizes video gaming. I mean, video gaming was almost dead from the failures of the E.T. game and the Pac-Man game, which have been... You can definitely find a YouTube channel off the top of your... Uh, just, like, at the tip of your fingers that explains why those nearly destroyed video gaming. Basically, video gaming was so dead, Toy Stores didn't want to have video games. They thought they wouldn't sell, which is why Nintendo called it an entertainment system and put a bad robot in it. A robot which was never designed to work well. But Nintendo was everything to the kids of the 80s. And so, when Nintendo started to popularize role-playing games, and those role-playing games had golems in it, golems hit even more widespread public awareness among the kids. Especially if they use Dungeons & Dragons monsters. So one of the most popular role-playing games of the Nintendo age, the third-generation console, was Final Fantasy. And Final Fantasy... Well, Dungeons & Dragons was pretty big in Japan. I, one group's Dungeons & Dragons game was later written to a novel called Lotus War and then made into a popular cartoon series. And so the Final Fantasy developers literally plagiarized and cribbed from the Monster Manual. They wrote stuff down. Like, when they were translating it into English, they would ha they had to change things. So, like, for the original little Final Fantasy, these guys with tentacle on their faces were called wizards, but every, trust me, me and every other Dungeons & Dragons kid knew, and they were able to use them in later editions of this same game. Yeah, those were mind flayers. Those were things specifically created by Dungeons & Dragons. The Mind Flayer is one of those few creatures that you don't see outside of Dungeons and Dragons because it's like a corporate mascot as a Funko Pop. And what else is sitting in the middle of Final Fantasy? The Mud Goal. Now, of course, this is 8-bit art, and it looks a little better shrunken, but let me show you uh, Amano's original concept art. And you can clearly see the Mud Goal is the Clay Golem. It's exactly what we would have thought it would be. And they also have the stone goal and the iron goal. You know, this, they have exactly what you would expect. The Dungeons and Dragons golems go into one of the two most popular role-playing games on the Nintendo Entertainment System. The other most popular role-playing game that used golems was Dragon Warrior, or Dragon Quest in Japan. and this is a huge franchise, both here and, and much, much more in Japan. Here, it was so big that when Nintendo decided to make a commercial that was 90 minutes long starring Fred Savage called The Wizard, and they gave out an issue of Nintendo Power, you know, to every kid who walked in the theater, one whole page was devoted to Dragon Warrior. So Dragon Warrior was a seminal game back in 89. But, um... In Japan, Dragon Quest is so huge that the Japanese government has an agreement to ask the video game company to release the games in the series only after working hours on Friday or on Saturday. Because if you release a Dragon Quest game in the middle of the week, 
so many people will stay home from work, it will noticeably affect the Japanese economy. And what did I find wandering around in the northeast area of the Dragon Warrior map? A golem appears. And here, it's literally, you know, the earlier ones were called Mud Goal because you could only get like six letters of a name on a Final Fantasy monster. But here, they name it Golem. And we can see, once again, it's probably not clay. It looks like it's made out of stone. It doesn't have a mess on the front. You don't kill it by crossing out the first letter of the word a mess to change truth to he is dead. But this is the golem. For all intents and purposes, for pop culture, you have your golem. And what's more, you make kids love golems. I used to spend Saturdays watching cartoons and seeking out golems. Why? Because in the game, there is one golem which is not made out of stone. There is gold man. And if you can kill a gold man, you can get a lot of gold. Oh, God. I look at this map, and I know exactly where this is in the game, because I used to spend hours before I even knew the word grinding on it. And once again, Dragon Warrior continues the idea that a golem can be made out of anything. In this case, we have the chocolate golem. And so here we have the modern conception of a golem. Anything that can be made out of an object is animated. So you have two different kinds of golems in pop culture today. Firstly, you have the ones where a golem is anything that's made out of the right materials. You know, you have Pokemon golems, golems made of doors, golems made of grinders, golems the flamethrower. The kitties love this. The snow golems from Adventure Time, the snow golems from Minecraft, the iron golems of Minecraft, which are... Much closer. I mean, the villagers create a being that made out of iron to protect them. You can still see the golem legend is there. I mean, even Disney gets in on it with the the comparative religion and mythology class I took, known as gargoyles in the nineties, where that's literally in the text. That is the clay golem of Rabbi Lowell of Prague being commanded by one of his descendants. And if one of the animators had not grown up as a Dungeons and Dragons kid, I doubt that would be there. Because, I mean, even if he was a, or she was of Jewish persuasion, or they, then it's entirely possible that they would not be able to say, yes, a golem, and no one would have heard of it, possibly without D&D, except for, you know, us Jewish monster kids. Now, the this segues the other way. Number one, you have... Anything animated is a golem. Number two, you go back to that original myth and you plummet for meaning. So, for example, Terry Pratchett's feet of clay, even if it's set in a fantasy world, as the golems have that sacred word written down, which animates them, and it goes into what is their psychology? What is that like? If a golem wants to be free, what would it do? And so you take that initial myth, and as Terry Pratchett and others are wont to do, you examine it, and you see what kind of meaning you can get through it. Uh, there's a brilliant work of urban fantasy I love called The Golem and the Jinn, in which uh, early 20th century New York, you have a golem, a golem woman who is created to be a man's perfect wife, and the man dies of a heart attack on the way over to the United States from Europe. And so the golem lands in New York, and she has to find a job and a place to live and a way to deal with humans. And then meets a wandering fire gin. This, oh, it's a great book. It's a really good book, and I really admire it. Finally, here is my last bit of evidence, if I have not brought it forth yet, that the golem is important to pop culture, because... Even if we don't have role-playing games and fantasy novels and cartoons and video games, you know something has come into pop culture when Bart Simpson is climbing in order to put in the golem's mouth words such as, well, let's just say he puts some writing into the golem and the golem knocks down his wall and he says, 
I didn't say kick Homer in the wall. But of course, this being The Simpson, this incredibly movie accurate golem corrected. So now it actually has the Jewish star instead of the pentagram. Graham is used to torment all the people that Bart wants to torment. He is given the power of speech by Lisa. And then they make a wife for it out of Play-Doh. You see a Play-Doh covering something, which is obviously the Jewish medallion. They create a clay Play-Doh golem wife. And she is voiced by Fran Dreischer, which means Homer immediately picks up an axe and says, well, back to the drawing board. But no, it, it works out for them. So once you have reached The Simpsons, you are a part of pop culture forever. The golems are here. Some of them are going to be the Rabbi Lowell golems, but I think for the foreseeable future, as long as you have some kind of video game or whatever video games eventually become, you are going to have kids spending their afternoon fighting animated objects, and they are going to be called golems. Rabbi Lowell's golem may be resting in a crate in Prague somewhere, but there's no way to really keep a good monster down. Now... Uh, the last golem works, I'm going to say, are, uh, well, influenced. I grew up as a Renaissance kid, so this is the part where usually the musician says, oh, here, please buy my CDs out by the stand. The writings I have on golems, firstly, it's running out of print, and I don't get any more commission from this, but honestly, I'm really proud of my story. In the book Hidden Youth, I have a story called The Red Thing in the Basket, in which... The golem is, well, you can guess what it's made out of. You would not believe how much research not only I did, but that you can do about 17th century Polish Jewish bagel vendors. It's a fascinating rabbit hole to fall down. But also, I wrote an entire mystery novel about golems called Murder with Monsters, in which a Jewish vampire girl and a Bigfoot who's falling for her have to save a golem in that a golem has been accused of murdering a rabbinical student. And of course, golems can't kill people, especially in my world, where in the 50s and 60s, the rabbinate went to a man of Jewish uh, background called Isaac Asimov and said, we like your robot stories. Can you help us make laws of dilemmics? So if you like the way I talk about monsters, I recommend my mystery novel. And um, it's taken me five years to work on the sequel because I'm dealing with the politics and morality of having hero cops in 21st century America. But I think I figured out how to do book two so that I don't feel guilty about it. And it's probably going to involve a lot of goals. So, ladies, gentlemen, others, friends beyond the binary, as Scooter puts it, that is the golem. And now, based on however I am allowed to, on um, because I don't know Twitch as well as I would want to, now I will get, um, is there, how can I get questions on this? Archie Fantasies, are you there? I know you can hear me. Okay. Well, no, it's, even if, um, is there some way where I can get questions or, no, I'm going to go Awesome, awesome. Oh, no problem. I'm honestly, thank you. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So I'm going to head to that. I'm going to try to see the chat in the general. And let me just say um, thank you and everybody very much for giving me this opportunity to talk because you know i had a heck of a ball thinking about this stuff over the next week i mean it's not like i haven't thought about golems continuously since third grade and i got that one monster in my pocket all right so i'm going to stop sharing my screen and i guess is this where i yeah stop sharing screen and i think no problem all right so i am at the
Oh, no problem. Okay, well, in that case, um, okay, I don't see anything in the chat room currently, but thanks, everybody, for coming. And Oh, short round. No problem. I, I very much enjoyed it. So I can see the chat. The chat's coming through. Does anyone have a question? Oh, wait a minute, because <laughs> I'm a public school teacher. I'm used to online teaching since March 15th. I know you have to wait a minute for the kids to actually write stuff down. Oh. Oh, absolutely. Thank you, God. No problem. All right. Well, um, if I don't see any questions pop up soon, then remember, my Twitter is at IWriteMonsters. And I love just people sending me weird questions about, like, you know, I've pontificated on who wins, a, uh, a werewolf or a windigo in a fight. So if you have any bizarre, obscure monster mythology or folklore question or just want to chat, feel free to hit me up on Twitter. And once again, yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, now, the interesting thing for me, okay, so for the audience, the traditional Dybbuk is not what we usually get in the Dybbuk box. Now, a Dybbuk is a kind of demonic spirit of the dead who usually possesses a body to mess stuff up. Gary, I would certainly be willing to think that Pinocchio might have been influenced by the Golem story. I mean, you know, these stories were widespread in Germany. So, yeah. Um, but um, the thing is, the Dybbuk box is this creepy pasta, which, and, you know, correct me if I get anything wrong, because it's been a while since I did a deep dive, and probably you did deeper, is the story of this person who buys the Dybbuk box and in class it like Twilight Zone style. They're like, never open the box. And they, you know, they eventually weird stuff happens with the box. And, you know, they made a movie about it. And. Oh. No problem. That's exactly the kind of horror movies I could use lately. Uh, but the thing is, what's weird for me is like, it's like the Chupacabra. Where the original Chupacabra that was reported in. Oh, no, it wasn't Guam. It, in South America or Central America, literally look like still from species. And then later, people who are telling stories about monsters use the monster Chupacabra's name, and suddenly the Chupacabra morphs in people's head to a dog-like thing. And so the, the Dybbuk box, it sounds awesome, but it sounds very far from the original mythological origins, you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Oh, short round. Once again, it's at I Write Monsters. Um, I will say, and I'm not sure, they're the word, I'm not sure I want to use here, but yes, the Twitter is I Write Monsters. Um, the best book on Dybbuk's I've ever read, fiction-wise, is the story about a Dybbuk woman who gets basically trapped in, I think it was a tree for hundreds of years. Yeah, basically, if you want to go back, Tim Burton's Corpse Bride is originally a Jewish story about a demon who gets a wedding ring put on her. And she gradually haunts and falls for her, the descendant of the witch who put the Dybbuk in that tree, who was a, who is currently a lesbian cab driver in New London. And yeah, the, the reason why I'm trying to go around it is it uses what was a homophobic slur in the title. So it's the D word for lesbians and the Dybbuk. 
but you can probably figure out what that is. But it's a it is it is a really funny title, but it's not my channel. So without clearing that for you, I'm not going to say it. However, it's a great book, and it you know it's written from a place of love, and it punches up and it doesn't punch down. So I, if we're talking about Dibbs, I wanted to mention that one because that is a great one. Awesome, very cool. All right, all right. Well, if that's everything, well then I it's time for me to put the kids down. Although I'm not going to erase the first letter on their forehead. Uh, strangely enough, the weirdest golem story I have is a golem story which was meant to be read in five minutes, totally traditional, and it's written by Sherry Lewis of Sherry Lewis and Lamb Chop fame. Yep. So everybody have a good one. And uh, I hope to do this again some other time. I would love to do this again and hit me up on Twitter if you want any monster questions. Have a good one, everybody.